So, um, hello, good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Fernanda Pedro. I'm the U.S. correspondent for the Brazilian newspaper for de São Paulo. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking, uh, of course, Human Progress for sponsoring this event in collaboration with the Office of Congress and Human Media Alliance. And thank you, of course, for our presenters for being here today and for our people listening to this discussion. Uh, the panel will focus on the legacy of the moral doctrine and the uh, possibility of a new approach to as well toward the Latin America and the Caribbean. This is an important and very timely discussion. First of all, because this month of December marks the 300th anniversary of the famous speech by President James Morrow, which he stated that the, it would be the US policy to oppose any interference by European powers in the affairs of Latin America and Caribbean nations, a policy that became known as the Moral Doctrine. Well, I remember when I first learned about it uh, in Brazil back to school. Uh, Brazil actually had just become independent from Portugal in 1923, and there it was, a foreign power promising to look over us. Um, Moral famously said that it would be America for the Americans, and I believe history shows us which Americans he meant by him. Um, but the, the moral doctrine is not something that we just learn in school, it's actually being still, being still talked about in Washington DC nowadays. Just last month, a group of US senators introduced a resolution uh, reaffirming the moral doctrine. And back in September, Congresswoman Lydia Velasquez, who we're going to be hearing from later today, uh, published an uh, open ad in Newsweek entitled It's Time to Move On from the Moral Doctrine. Today, you're going to be hearing from leading experts on US policy toward Latin America to hear their perspectives on how the moral doctrine has evolved in our contemporary area, how it has been reshaped to adapt to current US priorities towards the region, and uh, also about the impact of US regional policies uh, nowadays. We're going to first hear some brief remarks by two uh, members of the House of Representatives who know the region well and have been deeply invested in the discussion around US policy toward Latin America. Then we're going to hear from each one of our panelists here. So, just as a note to our audience, uh, the briefing is being live streamed and we're going to have a QA section afterwards. Uh, so, without taking any more time, uh, we're going to hear first from Congressman Greg Kazak. Congressman represents the Texas 35th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives. A labor organizer and son of Mexican immigrants, Congressman Kazar was sworn into office in January 2023 and serves as the whip of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Prior to being elected to Congress, he served on the Austin City Council for seven years. Congressman Kazar was also the lead author of Progressive Labor Policy in a so-called Right to Work State, helping pass paid sick leave ordinance in Austin, Dallas, and San Antonio. In the U.S. House of Representatives, Congressman Kazar has pledged to ensure our government agencies work for the working people. So, Congressman, turn it over. Hi, everyone. Yes, thanks so much to the organizers for putting this together, to the panel, and for all of you uh, for attending this. Uh, I'm Greg Kazar, brand new member here in the, in the house and have just seen how critical uh, these issues in Latin America uh, can be to us and how if any of us get involved, we can make a really big difference. Um, because while so much of our inboxes, so much of our constituent demands are around domestic policy issues, so much of what we're talking about here in the house, whether we're talking about climate change, uh, global instability, migration, hunger, all are tied to how it is that we treat uh, other nations and other working people. And if we do that right, we can really address so many of our issues here at home so much better. And there are not as many offices or members of Congress or NGOs working to solve those four issues. And one of the four issues that we face, uh, or the, some of the most core issues that we face are with those countries that are directly attached to us. Uh, we spend so much time, I feel like sometimes every single day I'm going out and voting on another amendment um, that has to do with China, fine, but we spend so little time um, and have put so little effort, I think, as a congressional body, especially here in my first year, into addressing the issues in the Americas. I recently uh, was uh, really, really honored and proud to have gone on a, my first uh, congressional delegation to Latin America, went to Brazil, Colombia, and Chile, um, and the Monroe Doctrine kind of hovered over us throughout all of those conversations because everyone was expecting some of us American um, elected officials to be coming from that place and people were like shocked to hear us say what do you think 
how do you think we can work on this together? How can we solve some of these shared challenges? It's not going to be news to any of you that the Monroe Doctrine uh, was supposedly you know, always, always cloaked in the idea that this is really better for Latin America. This is better for the Americas, just like our current posture towards Latin America oftentimes is cloaked in that, um, but ultimately has led to extraction and coups and global instability and more migration. Y'all know all of that. But what became so clear to me on this trip was not just how our policy to extract or suppress or support coups or not support democracy in Latin America Hubs has obviously been bad, but also what a huge missed opportunity it is for us to not be working on things together and cooperatively. So you, you know, all the books are about all the people that have died because of the Monroe Doctrine, which is horrible. But on top of that, when I've gone and talked to uh, leaders in these other countries, in these other places, there's actually enormous amounts of solidarity with the American people and with our shared challenges on how it is we can work together instead of on how to deal with this continued oppression, instead be working on how are we going to survive together? How is it that we're going to address the climate crisis together, given that in both Latin America and the United States, we are both, we both are subject to enormous storms and climate disruption, but also the technologies and the renewable energy of the future can really be built by us working together. How is it that we can tackle the global migration challenges together um, and deal with political instability together and deal with the rise of the far right and authoritarianism together? That's what people want to be talking with us about. And so leaving the Monroe Doctrine behind is not only leaving coups and extraction and putting corporate interests and political elites before everyday people behind, that's one key part, but it also opens up this enormous realm of possibility. And I think we'll only take a small group of us here uh, to start that and to really do it. Because once we do that, I think we'll be able to see very quickly how it actually benefits those constituents who are making phone calls and benefits the American people so much more. If we're making sure that not only we open up more legal pathways to migration, but that people aren't forced to migrate so much because we don't have needless sanctions that starve people instead of feed people. What would it look like if we can actually meet our climate goals much easier because we're not spending our time fighting one another or trying to make sure that elites in our country or in Latin America are the ones making wealth instead of everyday working people being able to do so. I know that Chimi shortly will also probably talk about trade and how there can be solidarity amongst working people um, in these countries. And if those working folks see democracy work, then that I think helps stop, stop out authoritarianism and right-wing interests that are connected across the Americas. And so um, I hope that as you all think of this, here it's out today's panel, uh, we don't just think about what it is we're leaving behind, but the amazing opportunity to build something new um, and actually fix problems that Washington DC has not only failed at fixing, but has been making worse. So I'm really excited to work on this alongside you. Alongside you. You'll have an excellent panel, an excellent set of people working on this, but I really do think a small number of us uh, can make a huge difference in leaving Monroe behind and creating something uh, that really, really will work for our people. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Congressman. And now uh, we're going to hear from Congressman Chuy Garcia. Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia proudly represents the fourth congressional district of Illinois. Um, he's a progressive voice fighting to improve the lives of his working class neighbors, many of whom are immigrants like him. He's a senior member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committees and a deputy leader of the Congressional Progress Caucus. Uh, Representative Garcia was born in Mexico in Los Pinos, Durango. He's the youngest of four children raised by his mother while his father worked in the United States under the World War II era program. In 1965, Congressman Garcia and his family immigrated to the United States with permanent resident status. Mr. Garcia began organizing for workers' rights and more inclusive safety services during his college years at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He entered political life in 1984 when he was elected committeeman of the Cook County Democrat Democratic Party. He quickly earned uh, recognition, recognition as a coalition leader between Chicago Latino and Black communities. So, Congressman, please, thank you for seeing. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Fernanda, and uh, good morning to all. I uh, want to thank uh, Demand Progress and Seabird, uh, in particular, uh, for pulling this uh, together. Um, as I was uh, working on some remarks uh, 
that's been over the last five years, uh, the unprecedented experiences uh, in DC and across the country. And as we look at Latin America, particularly during the pandemic and more recently, it gives us much to think about uh, envisioning a new relationship between the US and Latin America. So 200 years, Ya basta, it's time for a new beginning. And thank you for uh, helping us commemorate this 200th anniversary and more importantly, what is possible in uh, the coming uh, future for all of the Americas. So I'm going to deliver some prepared remarks so that I don't uh, filibuster and uh, get out of hand as I can. Uh, so I will uh, largely stick to my prepared remarks uh, for your sake, uh, no filibustering, I was told uh, this morning. Um, the district that I represent has one of the largest foreign-born populations of people like uh, myself. Uh, people who immigrated to the U.S. often pushed by factors resulting from or related to U.S. policy toward the region, and I am one of them. So my constituents and I and many you know, immigrants from across the U.S., <clears throat> are living testaments to the real human consequences of policy that we're discussing today. So with that, I'd like to focus on U.S. legacy of, of, of economic destabilization through mechanisms like unilateral sanctions, lopsided trade agreements, and regressive policies at the international financial institutions. That has led to the massive internal displacement and migration within the Americas. Let me start with sanctions. The human cost of the U.S. sanctions is immense and often ignored. Decades of indiscriminate sanctions against countries like Cuba and Venezuela and Haiti have little but the suffering of innocent civilians. And we see the consequences of that as hundreds of thousands of migrants undertake horribly dangerous journeys, often through the Darien Gap, most recently to come to the US, and they are in all of our major cities today. Another policy I'd like to highlight is uneven trade agreements like NAFTA and CAFTA DR, which have profoundly destabilized local economies in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. Under NAFTA, real wages in Mexico declined. Unemployment shot up. Subsidized imports drove small Mexican farmers out of business. Like other policies that will be discussed here today, they are bad for Latin American countries, and ultimately, they're bad for US workers, too, as jobs were cut and labor conditions suffered. As a freshman in Congress, I was very engaged with the NAFTA negotiation process with people like Rosa DeLauro. I actually ended up voting against the resulting USMCA because I wanted greater environmental standards and improvement even in labor, but we made some significant advances in that regard. I wanted both of those things to be stronger. There's not even one mention of climate change in the USMCA. Uh, in terms of NAFTA, I had been very involved supporting my former congressman, my predecessor in the 4th District, Luis Gutierrez, as he was being pressured and bullied into supporting NAFTA. I told him, your Mexican flag will be covered by progressives and activists in the community. So ushering in the USMCA was quite a step forward, in my opinion. Uh, with the noted reservations. I've been glad to see some of the enforcement mechanisms working better on both sides of the border and the international solidarity between labor unions that has helped bring us to that place. Much work remains to be done to strengthen protections in USMCA and fundamentally reshape CAFTA. I believe that we'll hear from some of our colleagues on the panel and this shortly. So let me quickly move on to the international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, key actors in the Western Hemisphere. International financial institutions 
or IFIs play a central role in the international economic architecture and they claim to do so in the name of poverty reduction and sustainable economic growth. But if these are also political institutions and the policies that they follow are the products of different interests, local, national, corporate, competing on uneven ground with tremendous consequences for internal displacement, migration, public health, and sustainability. I'm proud to be leading the congressional fight against IMF surcharges, which the U.S. has long supported at the expense of other countries' economic flexibility. I'm also pushing for another allocation of special drawing rights, or SDRs, which offers a cost-free opportunity for developing countries to invest in public health, education, and poverty alleviation. So far, the U.S. has refused to support another issuance, but I'm continuing to press the issue with other members of Congress. And finally, there is the development that is promoted through the World Bank and other multilateral banks. International corporations across different sectors like mining, <clears throat> energy, agriculture, have long used their disproportionate influence within smaller countries to disregard public health complaints environmental concerns, and indigenous rights. Those who protest this development risk being killed. Thousands more have been displaced and continue to be displaced as companies act with impunity. We see the echoes of that legacy unfolding in Guatemala today as we speak, where there is a coup d'etat intent effort to prevent the peaceful transfer of a democratically elected uh, president. So when these economic policies, uh, so when we line these economic policies up, destabilizing, exploitative, and frankly, imperialistic policies, we get a fuller picture of the Monroe uh, economic legacy. Military interventions kill, displace, and starved civilians. Often economic interventions do too, as we are experiencing and seeing in many of our neighborhoods across the US. So I'm proud to join my, my colleagues and fellow activists here today to call for a new different policy towards Latin America, one that prioritizes peace, engagement, and respect for sovereignty. We need a new approach, and I'm here today to stand with all who want to make that vision a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, for your remarks. And now we're going to start our discussion. Uh, I'm going to read a brief bio of each one of our panelists, but you can see, uh, read the full one printed out next to the sign sheet. So uh, we're going to hear first from Juan Gonzalez. He's the senior fellow at Great Cities Institute at the University of Illinois Chicago and author of Harvest of Empire, a History of Latinos in Latin America. For the last 27 years, Juan has also served as the co-host for the Democracy Now! Radio and TV News Show. Then we're going to hear from Laura Carson. She's the director of MIDA. Feminisms and Democracies, a regional feminist from Orion Policy Group Think, formerly known as the Americans Program. Uh, then we're going to hear from Jimena Sanchez. She's the director of the Andes from the Washington Office on Latin America. And finally, we're going to hear from Mark Weisbrock, who's the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Um, so starting with one, well, one back in April, you made a speech at a conference at American University about the moral doctrine we should know that initially the doctrine was greeted positively by Latin American leaders, but that afterwards it became clear to many in the region that the doctrine was turning into a quote unquote weapon of systematic oppression. Um, I wondered if you could expand on that thought and uh, also tell us what the moral doctrine means for you personally as an American born in Puerto Rico. Uh, and finally, I wonder if you could talk about US policy and the root causes of migration of Latin Americans to the US a subject that you have explored in your book, Harvest of Empire, and your new report, The Current Migrant Crisis. So please, one. 
And thank you and good morning to everyone and to uh, to Congressman Garcia and to Congressman Kassar and my thanks to Lydia Velasquez for uh, sponsoring and developing this, uh, this forum. Uh, yes, as I noted back in April when President Monroe issued his doctrine in December of 1823, uh, it was hailed uh, at first by Latin American leaders as a boon uh, to their fight for independence from Spain. But U.S. presidents soon turned the doctrine into a weapon to bully and dominate the region. As thousands of U.S. businessmen and adventurers headed south of the border, Latin America became the birthplace of the first great American multinational corporations, enriching some of our country's most celebrated families. The shameful record of U.S. extraction of the region's resources to the detriment of its people has been amply documented by numerous historians. Uh, what were some of those policies? The repeated military interventions, as mentioned, that led to economic dislocation and political instability, the siphoning of an enormous share of the region's national wealth for our own prosperity, especially through Wall Street debt financing, uh, political repression by Washington-sponsored leaders and civil wars fueled by U.S. arms shipments, and the aggressive labor recruitment by U.S. industries of low-cost Latin American labor to meet the needs of those industries. Moreover, the list of our military interventions during the 20th century is mind-boggling. Uh, I think the sponsored by Teddy Roosevelt and the U.S. Navy of a whole country, Panama, just so we could secure land from Colombia to build the Panama Canal. Interventions in Nicaragua five different times, Mexico three times, Honduras twice, Cuba three times after 1898, not counting the CIA-sponsored Bay of Pigs fiasco, Guatemala and the Arbenz coup in 1954, Chile and the Allende coup in 1973, the Dominican Republic invaded three times, including President Johnson's dispatching thousands of U.S. troops uh, in 1965 to squash a people's revolt that sought to restore a democratically elected president. Haiti in 1915 and again in 1994. Panama again in 1918, 1925, and 1989. And of course, Puerto Rico, where I was born, which has remained a territorial possession of the United States since General Nelson Miles and his troops landed in 1898. Uh, despite claims to the United Nations by our leaders during the 1950s that Puerto Rico had become a self-governing territory, my homeland remains under the sovereign control of Congress to this day, as made perfectly clear during the past seven years by uh, Washington's direct imposition of an outside financial control board. All Latin American nations know that Puerto Rico is a U.S. colony, and several administrations have acknowledged its current status must end, and yet Congress has repeatedly failed to pass legislation for true self-determination. The main theme of my book, Harvest of Empire, when I wrote it 25 years ago, is that mushrooming migration from Latin America, Asia, and Africa to the rich nations of the world can only be understood and ultimately will only be resolved by a reckoning with the legacy of the colonial empires, the U.S. and other Western nations created in those regions during the previous two centuries. Quite simply, much of the modern immigration crisis of the entire industrialized world is a direct result, an unintended result, but one nonetheless of the political upheavals and wealth inequalities those empires produced and sustained to this day. Throughout all these years, the Monroe Doctrine has been the main policy basis for U.S. action toward the region. It has never been renounced, except recently by Secretary of State John Kerry in 2013, a position which the Trump administration subsequently reversed. The history of, is directly related to our border crisis today. As we all know, record numbers of migrants have been apprehended at our southwest border the past two years with officials in New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and many northern cities suddenly facing thousands of asylum seekers in need of shelter. The media invariably highlight residents of these cities who are angry and frustrated at how scarce city resources are being diverted to the newcomers instead of the needs of their own communities, all of which is stoking greater division between us and them. Nowhere in these reports do we see attempt to connect the current crisis to the past 
Why, for example, have we suddenly seen this unprecedented surge the past couple of years of migrants crossing the Darien Gap in Venezuela? What of our own government's role in fueling this exodus? In late October, I authored a new report on how U.S. policy toward Latin America has fueled the migrant crisis. I think there are copies here available, and you can download it from the Great Cities Institute if you're watching online. As I noted in the report, Mexican migrants were this country's main source for cheap foreign labor throughout the 20th century, especially in the West and the Southwest, both through legal means such as the Bracero and other guest worker programs, and, and Mexican nationals still remain the largest percentage of unauthorized migrants to the country each year. But their numbers have been falling, and more undocumented Mexicans have left the U.S. since 2008 than those who have entered and stayed in the country. During both the Obama and Trump administrations, a new pattern emerged. The biggest surges in unauthorized migrants at the southern border shifted to the northern triangle countries of Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. The migrant flow, however, suddenly changed again during the past few years. Venezuelans apprehended at the border skyrocketed from 4,500 in FY 2020 to 265,000 in the first 11 months of FY 2023. In the same period, Nicaraguans jumped from 3,100 to 131,000. Cubans spiraled from just 14,000 in 2020 to more than 184,000 in 2023. Amazingly, more Cubans have sought to enter the United States during the past two years than at any time in U.S. history, surpassing the refugee waves of, of, of in the first years after the Cuban Revolution, during the Mario Boltlift of 1980, or during the Balsero Crisis of 1994. Of some 412,000 asylum applications filed in the Department of Homeland Security during the first 11 months of 2023, nearly half came from just three countries. Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. All three have something in common. They have been targeted by Washington for regime change through sanctions and economic warfare that has only made life worse for their citizens. Meanwhile, our government has largely ignored the economic and social needs of the region's people. For example, U.S. foreign aid to the 33 countries of Latin America and the Caribbean totaled just $3 billion in FY 2023 a big portion of which goes to fighting drug trafficking and for military training. That's less foreign aid than the U.S. normally gives every year to Israel, which is a small country and prosperous nation, while Latin America and the Caribbean are teeming with more than 650 million people, 32% of whom live below the poverty line in 2022. Moreover, the total foreign aid Washington gave to Latin America last year amounts to less than half of what it provided to the region 60 years ago during the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Instead of ramping up development assistance that would, ass that would assist Latin Americans in staying home, both Democratic and Republican administrations have repeatedly opted for more border enforcement, a policy that, like the drug war, has been a colossal failure. Between, 2020, uh, between 2003 and 2021, the U.S. spent an astounding $333 billion on agencies that carry out immigration enforcement. For the current FY 2024, President Biden has requested $25 billion just for the budgets of Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And he is even asking for another $14 billion in his emergency bill now before Congress. Despite all that money, migrant encounters at the border are at record levels and our immigration system remains completely broken. While we wait for the long overdue revamping of our immigration laws, however, we can still address the most recent crisis. To start, we should end the sanctions against Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Congress should sharply increase foreign aid to Latin America to address the root causes of why people leave. It should provide increased federal assistance to the northern cities and southwest border towns that are feeding and housing the migrants and we as a nation need to renounce once and for all the Monroe Doctrine's legacy of imperial control over Latin America. Thank you, Juan, for your remarks. Um, just to keep the conversation going, I'm going to ask uh, Laura a question. Um, Laura, you've been monitoring U.S. Uh, building security policy in the Americas. 
particularly in Mexico and Central America for many years now. And you have also been focusing on the impacts of militarism, in particular on women and children. Um, I wonder if you could help us understand why, despite the enormous amount of U.S. security assistance that has been channeled to the region in the last two decades, there seems to be more insecurity than ever in many countries. Um, and I was hoping also you could talk to us in particular about the U.S. and the uh, which suffered a military coup in 2009, but recently elected its first woman president by a huge party of votes. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, Fernanda. So thank you very much for the question. Thanks to the organizers for organizing this important event. And thank you, all of you, for being here. You know, for decades, and certainly since Plan Colombia, that Jimena will talk about in a minute, in Mexico and Central America, we have focused on the war on drugs in US policy with devastating results for those countries and for the United States. The drug war has been a primary interest of US hegemony in the region. And we've been tracking it very closely in Mexico since 2008, Merida initiative that was passed after ex-president Felipe Calderon declared the drug war in Mexico. The Merida initiative is actually a case study on the disaster of prohibition and supply side drug enforcement. The $3.3 billion spent in US public funds just in Mexico has resulted in levels of violence we never even imagined. Homicides shot up almost immediately when the homicide rate became a political liability for both governments. Organized crime and corrupt security forces began hiding bodies, creating a kind of agony for the millions of people who have disappeared, friends or relatives. The mothers, the families actually have organized in Mexico led by mothers of the disappeared, and it's one of the strongest grass move, grassroots movements now, given that there's on record 110,000 disappeared people in the country. Our organization has a feminist international relations perspective, and we, we've also been tracking the sharp rise in this context of generalized violence of femicides and sexual violence. Despite the failure, the Merida Initiative, like the Monroe document, Doctrine, has been proclaimed dead several times and constantly is revived. Um, the initiative changed names in late 2021 to the Bicentennial Framework, supposedly with greater emphasis on controlling, um, controlling violence. But this basic DEA model of a kingpin strategy remains in place. And lately, with the fentanyl crisis, there's been even more pressure on the Lopez Obrador administration to use military forces to block supply to the multi-billion dollar U.S. market. It's well documented why this model causes increased violence. I mean, very shortly stated, the security forces assassinate or arrest a drug cartel leader. Uh, a turf war breaks out with other cartels that are looking uh, to take over that particular route or that production area, or, and, that first cartel fragments into smaller cartels that not only traffic drugs, but be given the control they have over local communities, move into other branches such as extortion and even human slavery. In the United States, the misplaced resources and attention on foreign supply rather than attending to the real causes of domestic demand, not only generates violence, but fails to control illicit drugs or overdose deaths, as we can clearly see in the United States. There is literally no time and nowhere in the world where supply-side supply strategies have worked and for anything other than the enrichment of drug traffickers, because it drives prices up, and arms dealers in the perpetuation of the DEA budget. Blaming Mexico or any other foreign country for overdose deaths in the United States is not only a flawed analysis of the cause, but a xenophobic smokescreen for really solving the tragic life crisis of loss of life here. And so we've all heard the extreme proposals that are coming out now from Republican candidates of launching U.S. missiles at drug labs across the border, of invading Mexico again, 
and we can dismiss them as fringe grandstanding, but the fact is that they're actually being fed by uh, the Biden administration and some Democrats who are also pressuring Mexico to crack down and by this continued DEA-led supply-side strategy that pretends to locate the source of the problem and ludicrously the solution outside the borders of the United States. Effective foreign policy stems from solid backspace domestic policy. And we can decrease the violence by abandoning this punitive military police model and building a new paradigm on human health and well being for both sides of the border. The Central American countries have also suffered increased violence from the US backed drug war, anti crime, and anti immigration programs that are all kind of converging and that have drawn military forces or militarized police like in Honduras into domestic policing. Across the board, this has led to an increase in extrajudicial executions, civilian deaths, human rights violations, use of military forces to repress social movements, and gender-based violence. Honduras deserves special mention since it provides lessons, new challenges, and also an excellent opportunity to unravel much of the damage that's been done by previous U.S. foreign policy. Uh, we mentioned that the U.S. government uh, denounced the, the military coup in 2009, was originally denounced by the U.S. government, but then there was maneuvering beside the scenes to prevent the return of the constitutional president, Manuel Zelaya, and then uh, the U.S. government actually helped to stage spurious elections that ushered in a series of governments considered now narco-dictatorships with increasing evidence including two terms of Juan Orlando Hernandez, who will be going on trial in New York on drug trafficking and firearms charges that have also implicated many in his national party. These governments with US support converted Honduras into the homicide capital of the world and a major drug trafficking hub, despite the fact that much of that aid was actually counter narcotics aid. The democratic election now of President Xiomara Castro with broad popular support marked a new era. The government that took office in 2022 is making a serious efforts at restoring rule of law, but has faced resistance from elements of the old regime still in power, especially in the judiciary and legislative branches. There's grave concern over the role of the US ambassador, Laura Dogu, in support of elements of the old regime and corrupt business class. She has publicly spoken against efforts to clean up the notoriously corrupt Attorney General's office, criticized reform of fraudulent contracts entered into under the narco dictatorship, especially in energy, and supported the economic de development and employment zones called CEDES that were repealed in 2022 as unconstitutional, even going to uh, as far as to indicate support for investors who filed an $11 billion lawsuit against the Honduran government for protecting its own national laws and sovereignty that could leave the entire nation destitute. These zones essentially cede Honduran's resources and territory to transnational corporations and are widely opposed as an affront to sovereignty. They're a source also of violent repression against local communities, especially Afro and indigenous communities that oppose them on their lands. An attack, in fact, just occurred a few days ago, prompting Afro-Indigenous leader Miriam Miranda to tweet, with, 20, with 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine, the Black community of Crawfish Rock, where the attack uh, occurred, is under siege by U.S. investors in the Prospera Sede, which has generated a crisis and now an attack on our fellow community leader, uh, Vanessa Cardenas. Prospera has ne was never consulted with the community which of course is a violation of national and international law. November 29th was, inter was Women Human Rights Def <clears throat> excuse me, Defenders Day, and the State uh, Department issued a statement. Many groups denounced attacks on women defenders, including on Miriam and Miranda, and on Berta Cáceres, the feminist indigenous environmental leader who was assassinated in 2016 in Honduras. But policies that strengthen abusive security forces and foreign investment that denies human rights, rights, indigenous and women's rights in particular, virtually guarantee further attacks. 
If the, US, if the US government actively obstructs efforts in Honduras to eliminate corruption, roll back illegal land grabs, and reform the legal system, including the criminal and tax codes, instability, impunity, and poverty will continue, and out migration will rise. Well, I talked about migration, so I'll just describe what that looks like for us south of the border. It doesn't look like a surge or an invasion. It looks like the failure of states to protect vulnerable populations and a human tragedy of epic proportions. Health officials in Mexico report that as many as six in 10 women migrants, many of them fleeing sexual abuse, will be raped en route. We don't even know the number of disappeared or assassinated migrants. While whole families are at the border now in very dangerous uh, border towns with nowhere to go. Pulling immigration into this militarized uh, border control model further criminalizes migrants, enriches organized crime, and encourages government corruption. In fact, the more immigration policy becomes a priority in U.S. foreign policy toward the region, the more it fails. It's failing the U.S. economy, where jobs are going vacant. It's failing U.S. communities torn apart by persecution and deportation. And it's failing by all measures of human decency. I just have a minute left and I, I can't leave without touching on Guatemala. In Guatemala, we're just a month away from the inauguration of the president-elect Bernardo Arevalo, and uh, the people are in the streets defending their democracy very bravely, led by indigenous communities with high participation of women. It's facing a political crisis due to the desperate attempts of the group in power known as the Pact of the Corrupt to remain in power. The Attorney General's office just annulled the elections despite the fact that it had, they're totally bogus arguments and it doesn't even have the jurisdiction. There's a tax on the electoral tribunal because they've defended the election results and there's mass mobilizations throughout the country. The State Department has stood firm in defending the election of Bernardo Revolu, but we have to be vigilant because we know that there can be backsliding in that respect. The people are putting their lives on their line to on the line to defend their democracy, and uh, we have to stand and with them on that. They deserve no less. Thank you. Well, thank you, Laura, for your remarks. Um, from my perspective here, um, reading the coverage by the media, because the human aspect of migration is also overlooked to some of your remarks. Um, now we're going to go to Jimena. So, um, Jimena, you have dedicated many years of your life to the defense of human rights uh, in Colombia, with a focus on indigenous Colombians and Afro-Colombians. Uh, Chico Mene said that I have been deeply impacted by Colombia's Arctic conflict. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, the recent history of youth relations with Colombia, and particularly the legacy of Colombia? Colombia? Um, and also, could you talk about uh, the U.S. policy toward Brazil and Argentina, which you recently visited and, uh, as we know, just uh, elected a far right candidate, Javier Milei, who just took office yesterday? Well, thank you so much, Fernanda. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for this opportunity. In 2005, I worked as an unarmed international company for human rights defenders and campesino, black, indigenous, and internally displaced communities who declared themselves neutral from the armed conflict living in war zones in Colombia. On February 21st, 2005, right wing paramilitaries on the US terrorism list collaborating with the US funded brigade killed and cut into pieces with chainsaws two of these peace community leaders, their wives and their children, aged 11, five and 21 months old. Having spent time with those people, I can attest that these were humble farmers just promoting peace. This was during the US backed plan in Colombia, a $9.94 billion, mostly security, anti-narcotics and anti-insurgency aid package. This plan's premise was to end the export of cocaine to the US by attacking coca fields, by dumping an herbicide over those areas. Not only did Plan Colombia fail to stop cocaine from reaching the US, the aerial fumigation efforts dumped a carcinogen that destroyed rural farmers' food crops, 
led to health and environmental consequences and just dispersed the coca so that now it's growing throughout the entire country, often sold by its architects as a miracle security effort that has somehow pacified Colombia that should be exported elsewhere. Then Colombia's successes came at a horrific human toll. In a country which at the time had the highest IDP population in the world, it contributed to displacing 4 million more. It contributed to 4,300 extrajudicial executions of innocent people in the hands of US trained Colombian armed forces. These were cases where civilians were targeted because they would not be missed because either they were poor, rural, black, or disabled. These persons were subsequently tortured, killed, and then dressed up in guerrilla fatigues because soldiers were under so much pressure and also incentivized to produce body counts to show wins so Colombia could show the US it was winning the war against the guerrillas. Disproportionately affected and devastated by these policies were Afro-Colombian indigenous peoples, their cultures and their territories. This tragic situation galvanized their leaders, brave Colombian activists, in partnership with U.S. activists to protest and advocate for changes in U.S. policy. Over time, we did see a reduction in military aid and a shaping of an economic aid package that supports peace, human rights, justice, and ethnic communities, and positive human rights interventions. Thanks to the leadership of members of Congress, notably members of the Congressional Black Caucus, like Representative Hank Johnson, Representative James McGovern, and Senator Leahy, violations were reduced, defenders protector and protected, and justice advanced in certain cases. For 200 years, the U.S. Colombia relationship was based on defending the interests of the U.S. and Colombia's economic and political elites. In 2022, for the first time in its history, a progressive government not from these elites was elected to power. This government seeks to end the violence and protect with civilians by consolidating implementation of the 26 Sparks Peace Accord, peace dialogues with the ELN, and the dismantlement of regional paramilitaries and criminal illegal armed groups. Its security and drug policies seek, seek to get at the root of the problem while protecting civilians and reducing harm. The government also prioritizes environmental efforts focused to tackle climate change. These ambitious efforts require buy-in, resources, and strengthening of civil society. However, um, what we are seeing is that um, the House of Representatives decided to hold up much needed aid for peace and human rights in Colombia due to ideological reasons. Members of Congress should be seeking to do the opposite to make this aid and its agreements with Colombia, like the U.S. Colombia Labor Action Plan, the U.S. Colombia Racial Action Plan, as effective as possible so peace and human rights can be advanced. In 2023, for example, 155 social leaders were killed. These are environmental, indigenous, Black, and others. 44 former combatants who signed the peace treaty were assassinated and 90 massacres took place. A new U.S. relationship with Latin America should seek a relationship where governments are treated as equals and to strengthen peace efforts by designating a state and board and doing all it can to facilitate peace, including taking Cuba off of the terrorism list. As the first international accompanier to the ethnic chapter, the U.S. should be at the forefront of advancing Afro-Columbian indigenous rights. And it goes without saying that ethnic rights, Afro-Columbian indigenous, are also uh, beneficial to the world because it is also a dependent environment. Two quick words on Brazil and Argentina. During the Bolsonaro government, rights violations against indigenous, black, quilombola, LGBTQ Brazilians skyrocketed. Environmental destruction was rampant, threatening humanity. While Bolsonaro is no longer the president, Bolsonarismo and violations against these groups persist. The US Congress should work to stop violations against these persons and advance the racial action plan called JAPER which is the U.S. Brazil Racial Action Plan that seeks to combat racism and to stop racist violence. Lastly, I would not be here in the U.S. today if it hadn't been for uh, the U.S.'s Operation Condor. And I am actually one of the lucky ones. 
most persons who were children like me during that time um, had their parents tortured, disappeared, killed. And some of them over time learned that the very people who raised them were behind uh, the killing of their parents. On Sunday, Argentina inaugurated Javier Milei, an outsider self-proclaimed anarcho-libertarian whose vice president, Victoria Villaduel, is a dictatorship denier who justifies the state-sponsored terrorism that led to those crimes against humanity that are well known around the world. We really don't know what will happen in Argentina, but I ask that the U.S. Congress follow development there and do its utmost to act, preserve democracy, and prevent history from repeating itself there. Thank you, Jimena. Um, just a quick comment on uh, Brazil. I think that's uh, interesting because uh, a few weeks ago, I don't know if you're aware of that, a uh, Brazilian delegation of congressmen uh, came here to Washington, D.C., led by Eduardo Bolsonaro, uh, son of Jair Bolsonaro, and he was asking for uh, help from a few congressmen here from D.C. Uh, to kind of intervene in Brazil because they believe uh, Biden helped Lula get elected last year. So it's kind of a twist on the world of three over there. Um, now we're going to turn to Mark. So, uh, Mark, in your book, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2015, you write about the economic legacy of the International Monetary Fund in Latin America and the central role of the U.S. in IMF uh, policymaking. I wonder if you could talk to us uh, about the IMF in Latin America in the past and up to today, and also about your own research uh, and the other economist research that made the case that EU sanctions really are, as the United Nations describes them, quote unquote, you know, they are coercive measures. And uh, are used to force governments to do what Washington wants or to achieve regime change. And I wonder how does it fit in with the overall US foreign policy in the region now in the 21st century? Thank you. <clears throat> and thanks to the presenters and SR for uh, contributing to this and everyone else who's uh, who helped. I, I'm going to. Since I get to go last, I promise I won't throw those there as I depart from my prepared remarks to not only answer your question, but uh, also to fill in some detail. I think the many things were mentioned that, uh, that I, uh, of course, as they're working on for the next 20 years. And let me just do a summary of the last two decades of uh, U.S. efforts in Latin America, because I think this is, is this is loud enough now? Okay. Um, it's quite it's quite more extensive than you, you will see in, in the media. There's been a whole number of efforts, including the sanctions, which I'll get to, uh, but also efforts against uh, a whole number of democratically elected left of some uh, center governments, including in Brazil, Dilma and uh, and Lula da Silva. They uh, the United States contributed to the coups against uh, both of them. In fact, uh, Lula himself mentioned the Department of Justice uh, recently, uh, saying that they contributed to uh, putting him in jail so he couldn't run the 2018 election. And that's how we got uh, Bolsonaro, because he would have won. Everybody knows that he would have won if he were allowed to run in that election. And of course, that uh, conviction was later overturned, but not until it had done uh, what it was intended to do was to keep them from getting another turn. And uh, so, uh, and then Dilma as well, uh, U.S. officials made it clear, uh, both by coming here right after, uh, by, by inviting, I'm sorry, Brazilian uh, uh, members of Congress here, right, when, uh, right after the impeachment vote, and then making a, a speech in front of the embassy in the U.S. Embassy saying how great it was uh, to uh, be looking forward to working with a new government in Brazil when uh, the, the Congress had not yet even voted uh, to remove uh, Dilma from office. So those kind of things are huge because they show the most powerful nation in the hemisphere uh, actually wants what you are doing to get rid of, uh, to accomplish with lawfare 
what you couldn't win for 12 years at the ballot box. Okay, and that is what, uh, and then we can go through a lot more. I won't have time. I would need 10 hours to go through all the GGNM. I'm glad uh, Honduras was mentioned because that was on the record uh, that the U.S. Uh, prevented the elected president from uh, going back. And then, of course, you have Haiti in 2004, a coup that was supported uh, by the United States, and also the reversal of election results in 2011. And uh, let me mention Bolivia in 2019. I'm not going to be able to talk about Paraguay and say, <laughs> okay, I'll, just, I'll get to Argentina. Uh, you know, Bolivia in 2019 was a military coup. And that was, uh, you know, led by the Organization of American States, and that was done for Trump and Rubio and uh, the uh, friends of uh, Luis Almagro, who was seeking another term uh, as Secretary General. And this was very important, and Congress fought back, and thank you, uh, Chuy Garcia, he was a co-author of an op-ed, which was demanding uh, from the OAS answers to very uh, simple questions, because the OAS said that Evo Morales stole the election, which led to, uh, of course, the overthrow, and uh, and there was uh, they were lying. And I, you know, you can read the hundreds of op-eds that I've written for papers in the United States, and you want I almost never use the word lie, but in this case, you can actually show that they lied because what happened in the election was that he uh, Evo Morales vote in the last sixteen percent, his lead increased. And uh, then something that anybody who watches uh, elections on CNN can see happens quite often. And they tried to say that that was some kind of fraud. And they, they published uh, uh, several, uh, three reports and a speech uh, and press release, all not looking at this possibility, which was the most obvious thing that anybody would think of, that the votes came from areas that were more sympathetic to Morales. And that's all that happened there. And they lied. And uh, really, it wasn't until the executive editor of the New York Times intervened and uh, got his reporters to print an article in June of 2020 saying that that whole narrative was false. That they had been reporting for, for eight months. And, and then, uh, you know, it changed. And I think that's partly, and this is where I want to say how important Congress's role is, because Congress went after them. For quite a while, and there were countries in the OAS who still are who want to get rid of this guy, and because he committed a real crime, Luis Almagro, by leading this uh, coup against the democratically elected government, an indigenous government, by the way, uh, indigenous leader of a country that has the highest indigenous uh, uh, percentage of population in the uh, Americas, and also, uh, you know, that's who was uh, massacred by the right-wing uh, government that took over. And so uh, that, uh, you know, that the, the, the congressional efforts really do make a difference. And, and I'm gonna show where I think they can do even more. Sanctions, okay? This is really huge because this has become a more powerful weapon than the military for enforcing uh, US government, what the US government wants in countries around the world, and especially in Latin America. And I'll look at the Venezuelan sanctions because that, uh, as Juan mentioned, is a huge part of the portion of the refugees coming. And, you know, it was, it's, it's very serious. It's lethal. You know, uh, if you look at, uh, there was a study of mortality after the 2017 uh, sanctions from Trump, which were the broad economic sanctions that really were lethal. And uh, they found a 31% increase in deaths. That's over 40,000 deaths. And you can look at other, uh, other studies as well of the effect of the sanctions. And what they do is when you get a terrible depression from sanctions, people die, okay? The estimate of the loss of, of income of the country uh, from the 2017 sanctions is 37% of Venezuela's uh, GDP. But that's, you know, if you compare that to the four worst years of the Great Depression, the Great, you know, that was 29%, okay? So this would really destroy the economy and people die. And it's disproportionately children, you know, they have been, because they die from childhood diseases because that, that they would survive if they were not in a weakened state as a result of the lack of uh, uh, food and medicine. 
you know, the malnourishment in Venezuela now is 27% according to the Food and Agriculture Organization. Now it was three before you had this mess that uh, that the United States uh, really uh, contributed enormously to. So now, uh, and, and this is, by the way, this is illegal too. I want to read just one thing from uh, Jim McGovern, Congressman Jim McGovern, who wrote a letter two years ago uh, to President Biden calling for an end to sanctions on Venezuela. And he was very clear. And he said, the impact of sectoral and secondary sanctions, that's the broad sanctions that are killing people, is indiscriminate and purposely so. Economic pain is the means by which the sanctions are supposed to work. But it's not Venezuelan officials who suffer the cost. It's the Venezuelan people. It's a life and death matter for the Venezuelan people. And that's really, uh, and Pompeo, of course, bragged about this, but the government was showing that this is actually a crime to target the civilian population in order to achieve regime change. So this would be actually a war crime under the Geneva Convention if people were shooting at each other, okay? Uh, but they're not. So it's not technically covered by, but UN experts have argued repeatedly that some things are a crime when, when armed forces are engaged is also a crime when they're not. So this is something I think Congress can really uh, actually reverse. This is a country which is different from most other uh, high income countries in the world. And the, the Congress really has a, a, a constitutional role in, in foreign policy that you don't see in uh, other countries. And so it really, I think, is so important in holding the executive accountable. Now, uh, the Argentina and the lay story, this is interesting too. This is another story where, you know, the narrative that you see, I don't do media criticism here. I'm just saying what I read. <laughs> okay. But the story you hear is that, you know, you had terrible inflation and the previous governments was a, governments were a failure. This was the Peronistas who, you know, started in 2003. And, uh, you know, and therefore you got this uh, right wing lunatic, which the media kind of recognizes as a lunatic. And uh, they don't like him, just like they didn't like Bolsonaro when they brought him there. Okay. It wasn't their intention. So, how did they bring the lay there? Uh, not just the media, but how did the United States contribute? Well, it was really quite huge because if you look at the actual record of the Peronistas, it was extremely good. They reduced poverty by 71%, extreme poverty by 81%. Their economy grew, uh, you know, three times as fast as Mexico did, for example, uh, during the 13 years that the Kirchner's uh, were in power. They were successful by any uh, social economic measure you, you want to look at. And uh, how did they get removed? Well, it came a lot from the United States. In 2012, a judge in New York told uh, that his rule that Venezuela could not pay 70% uh, of its bondholders. And this is when they were just about to go to the Paris Club and resolve everything. And, and, and so they would have continued and you would still see a successful uh, social uh, and economic progress. And that really uh, destroyed everything. And then uh, what happened? Uh, they lost in 2015, and Macri came in, and he went to the IMF and got the face to Trump, the largest loan they ever gave, $57 billion. They gave attached uh, conditions uh, to it, and those conditions were devastating. The typical austerity, you know, uh, raising interest rates, uh, cutting the budget, and then that caused the recession right away, and then they doubled down on it, and they made a mess. And the Peronistas were not able to clean up that mess in four years. And there I could have to, you know, I have to go into more of the economics to explain why that, how that happens when everybody flees the currency and nobody wants to hold it and you end up with an inflation depreciation spiral. And that's what the, that's what gave us Moulet. And he's going to make, uh, thank you. Uh, He's going to make a bigger uh, mess, uh, but it's not a result of the failure of his predecessors. It's a result of things, and there were other things too that came. You know, the U.S. government intervened to cut them off from hard currency, the IMF, the IDB, not the IMF, the uh, the World Bank and the IDB. And this is uh, this is what 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 brought us uh, the lay. So uh, I want to. I'm going to just conclude. So it's not the filibuster. Uh, 
because I want to conclude on a better note. Okay, first of all, you can see how tough it is to elect and keep a decent government anywhere in Latin America when the United States is doing things like this. And you know, if we had something like this, and like another power over us, we're struggling to keep Trump home. <laughs> coming back and you know he would still be here if we had something like this intervening uh in january 6th and that's what would happen if we had but uh but they actually did it okay from 2000 i'm saying latin america we really succeeded from 2003 to 2013 uh they had uh the uh, the majority of the hemisphere had left of center independent democratic governments okay that was uh and as there that never happened before. And what happened? Poverty fell from and these are probably all our numbers we we fuss about this. Okay, these are these are real. And poverty fell from 44 to 28 uh, percent after increasing for 20 years prior to that. They were poverty was increasing the whole time. Okay, that was the worst uh, economic failure, by the way, the part where the IMF was heavily involved, 82 thousand it was the worst economic performance in Latin America in a whole century. And that's how you got uh, all those uh, governments in the uh, 21st century. So uh, this is really, uh, so this was really something. And unfortunately, uh, some of these governments uh, were, you know, came under attack from the United States. But I think it is changing now. That's why we have this government in uh, Colombia now. That's why we have a, uh, a government in uh, Mexico, which in 2006, when he lost by 0 0.6 uh, percentage points in an election where half the ballot boxes didn't add up, <laughs> okay, uh, the United States jumped in to make sure uh, that he wouldn't be able to challenge this. And so I think things are, are changing, especially the work that the Congress did on Bolivia makes it less likely. I think that actually is affecting what's happening in Guatemala. I think if you didn't have that uh, enormous uh, pushback and changes in the US Congress that we're looking at right here, uh, we don't know what the executive will be doing in Guatemala right now. Uh, and so there is progress and there's gonna be, I think, a radical uh, change a radical new idea to replace the Monroe Doctrine, which is that people get to choose their own governments in Latin America. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you to all our panelists for their remarks. Now I'm very happy to welcome here Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez. Um, Congresswoman has made history several times during her tenure in Congress. In 1992, she was the first Puerto Rican woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. She was the first Hispanic woman to serve as ranking member of a full committee in the history of the House in 1998 and as chair in 2006. She was born in Arcoa, Puerto Rico, a small town of sugar cane fumes in 1953 and was one of nine children. <laughs> I'll go to work as a sorry congresswoman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go to work as the top Democrat on the Small Business Committee, the second most senior Democrat on the House of Financial Services Committee, and a member of the Natural Resources Committee keeps her busy. Ranking member Velasquez can often be found close to home, working for the residents of New York's seventh district. Um, in her open ad and music that I mentioned earlier, she called to turn the page on years of failed U.S. policies in Latin America and build a collaborative relationship that treats countries as equals and helps address the shared challenges we face. So this conversation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you too much information. <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to give some remarks. I'm sorry I could not attend the first part of this event because as ranking um, the small business committee, we were holding a hearing. And um, since I am the ranking member, I'm not the chair, I don't control the schedule, but that will change soon. Uh, first, let me thank uh, Demand for Progress for hosting this historical briefing. I hope that this is the first, but not the last, that we will continue to have a more dynamic presence, visibility, 
and exchange of ideas uh, that will bring stakeholders and members of Congress and congressional staffers. It is important that, that we have this type of discussion so that we form, we form um, policies and legislation that is important when it uh, is related to the uh, hemisphere and Latin America. Uh, I also want to thank the panelists, especially my friend Juan Gonzalez, Jimena Sanchez from Bola, Mark from Six, Seeker, uh, Laura Carson from Mira, and thanks also to our moderator, Fernanda Perrin, for being here today. As December marks um, the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine, some of us here in Congress are working hard to undo its legacy. Under the guise of this policy, the United States has inflicted tremendous pain on our Latin American neighbors, Puerto Rico included. To begin to move forward, the U.S. first needs to recognize its involvement in coups and cover interventions that have supported anti-democratic government throughout the region. Instead of a new Cold War of coercion and intervention, the U.S. can win over the hearts and minds by promoting human rights and workers' rights while respecting self-determination and sovereign decision-making. The U.S. must move away from the old paradigm of dictating how this country should govern from Washington and support them in noble efforts to tackle our biggest challenges. As such, I hope this expert panel today sparks a conversation on how to move away from the nefarious legacy of the Monroe Doctrine and start righting the wrongs <laughs> of the past. The United States cannot hold itself a leader on the world stage as it continues to have colonial rule, like in the case of Puerto Rico, where more than 125 years of American imperialism has brought the island its worst financial crisis in history and accelerated population decline. The United States cannot talk about promoting democracy worldwide while continuing to support policies that hurt every pe everyday people just to send political messages, like in the case of sanctions against Cuba and Venezuela, which have sparked migration and human rights crisis. So doesn't matter if we reach an agreement here on the supplemental, which I think is not gonna happen, but uh, putting band-aids to uh, the migration crisis and the border is not gonna cut it, it's not gonna do it. We need to tackle the root causes of intervention in Latin America, and that will only turn the tide on the migrant crisis. Plus making meaningful uh, resources, meaningful uh, support, economic support to Latin America and allowing for those governments to make their own decisions as to how that money should be used. From mass migration to climate change, we cannot hope to address the pressing challenges that our hemisphere faces with antiquated policies like the Monroe Doctrine. This moment calls for an American foreign policy toward Latin America based on cooperation and mutual respect. I look forward to working with my colleagues and everyone here to make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. And now we're gonna start our Q&A section. Uh, I'm sure that you have must have a lot of questions after all this great debate. Um, just a heads up uh, for folks watching us at home, you can send your questions using the Q&A box. And uh, for our audience here, you can just raise your hand and we're going to go over to the mic. But first, uh, I'm going to start with a uh, few questions that we received beforehand uh, online. The first question is, um, for certain social and political groups in Latin America, a defining feature of U.S.-Latin America relations is the judicialization of politics or law. To what extent do these discourses and the practice that they label render economic and political collaboration in the region difficult? 
this question. Now we're going to do a couple more. Second question is um, President Lopez Obrador suggested replacing the Organization of American States with an organization without the US. And there have been other initiatives to form a Latin American Caribbean bloc that would challenge US dominance. What do you see happening over the next few years? What will, will allow this initiative to succeed? And final question. How might the U.S. take accountability for its significant involvement in destabilizing the many democracies in Latin America in a reparative and yet sustainable manner? Um, I think we can go first with Mark to do that. Is that great? Right? Yeah. Sure. Well, uh, let me take the second one. The the OAS. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I think that. First of all, Congress has a huge voting, you know, 60% of the funding the OAS comes from the United States. And oh yes, how's that? Got it? Okay. So I think that uh I don't think there's gonna be uh oh there is an alternative, you know, Latin America did that's one of the things they did during their decade of uh resident governments they created in the uh, community of Latin American and Caribbean uh, states as an alternative to the OAS. And it, it never quite took off, but it, did, it was important because it was a place where Latin American countries could meet without the US and Canada. <laughs> and uh, so they could talk, <laughs> they could plan things. And that was uh, important. And it's still, uh, I think it will be increasingly important. I don't know the, you know, uh, this is a problem that the United States has control over these institutions. And you know, you can look at all the ways that you can talk to people in the OAS and they'll tell you how they maintain this control. You know, you have, if you're uh, representing your country here and you have children, they want to stay in the country, you know, who, who gets your who gets your visa. And uh, there's all kinds of leverage they have to get the votes they need. And uh, so this is a real uh, problem. And I think that, uh, I think there is, like I said, I think there is uh, progress because of the pushback that the OAS, at least the electoral observation missions, are picking their, uh, are, are not going to do uh, very easily what they did in Bolivia and what they did uh, in Haiti and uh, twice, actually. Uh, and they, you know, they've done other uh, places in the past as well. Uh, I think that that's, that's where we would get there. What was the first one? The other question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the law there is horrible. You know, uh, I think, you know, this is what I read written about this. Uh, you know, Ecuador, hardly anybody knows this, but, you know, the president of Ecuador, uh, who was presided over, you know, a decade of, the, again, the most successful uh, policies that the country has had, uh, Rafael Correa. He's he's under an eight year prison sentence uh, and he can't go back to the country. And you can look at the case. The case is a joke. You know, Interpol won't even issue a warrant. He's got political asylum in Belgium. He can travel anywhere almost in the world other than the US without any fear of extradition because everybody knows it's not a real case. And here he is. He was the president. He would win right now. In the last election, if he, if he ran, he still got huge 60% uh, approval at least uh, because of all the economy. This is lawfare. And you you didn't read about this anyway? This is amazing that this isn't, uh, and, and uh, you know, I can tell you more stories about that. So yeah, it's a very serious uh, problem uh, and it's been used in, in Argentina as well and other countries. And so uh, this is something that, again, Congress uh, can expose this. And we really appreciate, by the way, all the letters that members of Congress have. Uh, you know, some of the people here uh, were here. They that and they have done. It really has an impact in, in Latin America. Thank you, Mark. Um, we don't have much time, so we're going to go uh, at a question from the audience here. So please raise your hand if someone has a question. Okay. Um, Okay, then we're gonna go back to the questions that we see in the line. So, Laura, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Well, on the first one, Mark talked about kind of the macro impact of lawfare, where they've actually um, changed the history of who rules a country. 
in several cases and uh, completely completely changed around the politics of it. But this stems in large part from the capture of judicial, judicial systems by elites, uh, which is a serious problem, obviously, in the balance of power. On another level, it's also uh, a very important problem because once that happens, there it's used against land defenders, for example, with, uh, with human rights and land defenders. And so that means that projects that violate environmental or social laws um, uh, are, are allowed to go forward and not as mega projects because those who oppose them and defend their land and defend the laws are in jail. You know? and, um, and so it's, it's completely changing the political scenery in the country. The second question, uh, Lopez Obrador, uh, especially at the beginning of his of his administration, a lot of effort into into increasing the south south ties that were developed during that first uh, progressive kind of tide in Latin America, including the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, Silac, and um, the end of San Salvador, Sur, which was important during that first period. And the reason, of course, is obvious, that a way that they could get together without U.S. hegemony calling the shots on everything, which is the case in the OAS as well. And especially with this alliance with, uh, uh, with Luis Almagro, who has been proven himself time and time again, willing to do the U.S. bid in order to um, deny democratic changes and self-determination in different countries. Uh, we expect that, that that will continue and that there's a new possibility for that kind of organization to happen. And it has positive results. It's had positive results in the past. We've seen uh, cooperation on vital issues. We've seen those kinds of South-South organizations be able to resolve highly charged conflict issues that couldn't have been done elsewhere. And then finally, in terms of reparative, you know, talking about reparations, for the destabilization, the anti-democratic uh, influence of the United States, you know, it's a very difficult issue to move on, obviously, because first of all, there's been very little recognition of it um, in, in most cases, even some of the most blatant cases. And when it's recognized, it becomes like just kind of maybe a declaration that's later falls flat. But what the people are doing in these countries in terms of historical memory, reviving that, you know, going back to the dictatorships and, and putting those generals on trial, the genocide trials in Guatemala, what they're doing in terms of pushing that, to that those kinds of crimes will never be forgotten. It's going to be uh, a significant impulse, a significant support for people here in the United States to do the same and to deeply investigate and expose those historical roles of the United States as well. If, if, uh, yeah, if I can add a couple of things about this the whole issue of the, especially the possibility for uh, getting rid of the Manuel doctrine, we've had, I think, also look at the broader picture of uh, it's no longer a unipolar world uh, that we live in. And the reality is that uh, Latin America has got more room to maneuver uh, as a result of the changes that have occurred, uh, especially the influence of. of but China as a source of not only development loans, uh, but also uh, financing, because clearly the IMF and the World Bank have strangled Latin America for all of these years. And now I think the decision uh, to uh, uh, install Dilma Rousseff as the, as the head of the new development bank of BRICS is a major, major, uh, provides great opportunity for Latin America to break hold economically, not just in terms of the, the military impact of the United States, but economically. Uh, the the U.S. war with uh, economic uh, war with China has resulted in Mexico becoming the main source of new investment, uh, what they call nearshore. Uh, American capital no longer wants to have all of its investments in, in South in Asia now. They increasingly are nearshoring their production into Mexico. So now Mexico is now the largest trader 
with the United States in the world. Uh, so this means that if a, a progressive government continues to function in Mexico, uh, that's going to provide Mexico much more leverage in terms of U.S. policy. So I think there's a lot of positive aspects of the geopolitical situation that has occurred that makes it more possible to break free of this Monroe Doctrine control. Uh, even though the war in Ukraine has forced the United States now to ease the sanctions with Venezuela because they're increasingly concerned that they need oil supplies closer to home uh, than they do in uh, other parts of more dangerous parts of the world. So there's a lot of change occurring and the combination of the indigenous movements uh, from below and the geopolitical changes, I think create a greater opportunity, even though it looks dark right now for Congress to announce, you know, uh, pass a resolution renouncing the Monroe Doctrine, I think the reality of the changing of uh, much more multipolar world is making a greater possibility for that to become real in the not too distant future. Thank you, Juan. Now I'm going to hear from Jimena. And Jimena, if you please could uh, also wrap up so we can uh, with your policy recommendations and we can do a final round of policy remarks. Okay. Um, thank you, Juan. Um, I think that the recommendation is that we need to look at the Monroe Doctrine as a tool for and unfortunately, here in the U.S., there's this like belief that if you have a case against you, there must be some truth in it, and there is evidence. That's not the case in Latin America. Perfect example: there were five um, sugarcane cutters, African Columbus, that were put in jail supposedly for terrorism um, in Colombia. And I'm looking through the uh, case against them, and the proof that they were uh, colluding with terrorists was their meeting with me. So there you go. <laughs> and that kind of thing is rather very common. And the problem is that once that state is there, until it gets resolved, nobody, especially nobody from the US Congress, wants to get involved. Um, should I go ahead and the Yeah, yeah. Okay, so my basic recommendation is that the relationship between the US and Latin America has to be completely radically different than it has been in the past 200 years. It should support uh, governments and their efforts to advance security with a human focus, address drug policy in the matter that is humane and does less harm, add harm. Um, it should uphold basically the rights of Afro-descendants and indigenous in the region and include the recommendations as well as be consulted with those movements throughout the uh, Americas. And in the case of Colombia, uh, most importantly right now, the aid that's being held up in Colombia should not be held up. Uh, the tactic should move forward. It's fine if the security part doesn't go through, but the <laughs> peace, human rights, justice, and Afro-Columbian and indigenous parts definitely need to move forward. And then my last quick comment would be that please don't forget Latin America. I know there are many things going on around the world, but if Latin America starts to fall apart, you're going to have a much more complicated situation than just a lot of migration along the border. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mena. And now, what can give your policy recommendations? Well, you know, I, I think I gave them in, in my address. I think the key thing is uh, the sanctions have to be, and that's an immediate thing that could be done uh, more quickly if there was the will to do so. Uh, and um, and I think that the increased aid, to, I mean, I was stunned in the, C, in the Congressional Research Service report to see that back in the 1960s, the United States was giving far more uh, economic and social development aid to Latin America, more than twice what it's doing today, of course, Back then, the Kennedy and Johnson administrations were concerned about revolution sweeping the region. So they had an incentive uh, to try to uh, ramp up uh, 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 foreign aid. But the ridiculously low amounts of foreign aid to an entire section of the world is just astounding. And Congress can't do something about that. It wouldn't go, you know, to go from $3 billion to $10 billion in kinds of budgets that the United States uh, uh, proves that they would not be very difficult, but it would have an enormous impact uh, on the economic conditions in many of these countries and therefore incentivize more and more people to stay. Uh, you know, the reason why Mexico has dropped so much in terms of undocumented migration is because things have been improving in Mexico. You know, the labor, the labor uh, uh, wages have gone up uh, uh, under Lopez Obrador. There's been a, a, a sharp increase in economic activity in Mexico, so fewer Mexicans are leaving. So if we could promote that kind of economic and social development in the rest of the region, it would be a bigger bang for the buck than all the money was throwing at militarizing the board. Thank you, Juan. And uh, Laura, any policy recommendations? 
Thanks. Um, first of all, full review and and reform of drug war policies. And there have been several congressional letters to this regard, the Youth of America Initiative and, other, and others. And related to that, a full investigation on the international and specifically activities of the DEA. There have been the GAO has repeatedly called them to task for lack of oversight, they use criminal informants, they trigger violent conflict, it's causing tension directly with the Mexican government now. Um, and while they recently evaluated themselves, they looked at some compliance issues and recognized critical incidents, just to give you an idea very briefly of a critical incident. A critical incident is when the DEA, along with Honduran officials, massacres indigenous people in Awas, which happened in 2012 in Honduras. You know, and so, uh, so they're fairly major, these critical incidents. That's really important to just look at what they're doing. Anti-militarism measures. These control uh, include controlling arms sales and smuggling that end up in the hands of the cartel members, and as well as military aid to the region. Encouraging civilian policing according to international human rights standards and acknowledging the human cost of fighting violence with violence. Um, in terms of Honduras, non adherence in efforts to make reforms. And then finally, in immigration, even without the elusive comprehensive immigration program, there's a lot that can be done, including legalizing working members of communities, respect for the right to asylum, compliance with the right of children to live with their parents through family reunification programs, and providing work with full labor rights and path to citizenship, and of course, looking at those root causes that have to do with U.S. foreign policy and that of Kennedy the last years. Thank you, Laura. Um, Mark, I'm so sorry, but I'm gonna have to wrap up. They decided that we're running out of time, but I'm sure we can talk about your policy recommendations now. Please feel free to stay and have a coffee and we'll hang around. And also I'd like to point that there are some materials on the table just outside the room, like the report by Juan. So please feel free to grab something. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you for our finalists over here and thank you for the congressman and for someone that joined us. And that's it guys, thank you, bye-bye. I don't I think we're